There is a lot of controversy about reaching the North Pole, which at first may seem a little bit confusing, since there is no doubt about reaching the Southern Pole, which was reached roughly in the same period. Now, why is that? That may be due to a couple of things. But the most important reason, probably, is that, you see, at that time, it was actually quite hard to prove being at a certain location, and especially at the northern pole, because unlike the southern counterpart, which is located firmly on a continent, the North Pole is located in the middle of the sea, covered by a gigantic sheet of floating ice, which moves every year. So even if you would leave a message there, it could be found in a completely different place already the next year. Having said all of that, the story is still incredibly fascinating. The earliest, one of the earliest attempts on reaching the pole took place in 1827. A British naval officer and also an Arctic explorer, William Edward Parry, set out to the north from Spitsbergen. Although his expedition wasn't completely mm, successful, let's say, he did actually set a record for human exploration farthest north, which was uh, 82 degrees 45 minutes north. In 1871, the Polaris expedition founded by the US government was led by Charles Francis Hall, who was an experienced Arctic explorer and a self-taught one. He actually also previously lived among Inuits. However, he didn't have enough academic background, academic preparation, and he also had no idea how to command a ship. Poor leadership uh, quickly caused conflicts among the crew. When they reached the Thangard harbor in Greenland, Hall fell ill and quickly after that died, accusing crew of arranging his death. The next prominent expedition, this time founded by the Royal Navy, was the one led by Albert Hastings Markham, who is also known for designing the flag of New Zealand. Despite the fact he was poorly clothed and suffered from scurvy, he still managed to set a new record of reaching 83 degrees, 20 minutes and 26 seconds north in May 1876 before returning. The next attempt with the US naval officer George the Long in command ended tragically when the ship was crushed by ice, killing most of the crew. However, in April 1895, two Norwegian explorers left the ship icebound and set out to the pole on skis. Frithof Nansen and Hjalmar Johansen set another record of reaching the latitude of 86 degrees 40 seconds long north before they finally returned south and reached Franz Josef Land. Two years later, an engineer from Sweden called Solomon August Andri tried to reach the pole with two other men using a hydrogen balloon. They called the balloon the Eagle. Unfortunately, they were caught by powerful winds, which together with the rain created ice on the balloon, forcing the explorers to make a semi-control landing about 300 kilometers north from Kvitoya, which is the northeasternmost part of the Svalbard archipelago. They trekked for three months and eventually reached Kvitoya, but they couldn't continue their route and perished there. The last prominent expedition of the 19th century was the one by Italian explorers, Captain Umberto Cagni and the Duke of Abruzzi, Luigi Amadeo, who was also a grandson of King Victor Emmanuel II. They set out on the converted whaler called Pole Star in 1899 from Norway and managed to reach latitude 86 degrees 
31 minutes north, beating the last record by at least 35 kilometers. The famous breakthrough happened 10 years later. That's also where the whole controversy began. Once upon a time in 1909, Frederick Cook, a medical doctor from New York, announced that he reached the pole with two Inuit companions over a year earlier in April in 1908. He claimed that his return southwards was not possible due to the bad weather conditions and the drifting ice and that they were forced to winter over in an ice cave. However, only a week later, Robert Edwin Perry, who was a civil engineer and a commander in the US Navy, announced that he had reached the North Pole with his, with his longtime companion Matthew Hansen. He denounced Cook as a fraud. Cook's expedition set off from Gloucester in Massachusetts in July 1907 on a schooner to northern Greenland. There he established his base camp in a native village called Annawatok. They began their journey with nine companions in 1908 in February uh, with 11 sledges pulled by 103 dogs. The Cook's party went at an average of 15 miles or 24 kilometers per day. At some point, as it was planned, the Cook's support team turned back, leaving him, leaving Frederick with only two Inuit men. According to his account, the three men struggled against a powerful wind and made every breath painful. However, on the 21st of April 1908, his custom-made French sextant showed that they were at at a spot which was as near as possible to the pole. After spending two days at the pole and leaving a note in a brass tube in one of the crevasses, they began their way back. However, they were carried by an unexpected westerly drift and ended up 100 miles or 160 kilometers west of the planned route. This forced Frederick and his two companions to hide in a cave on the Devon Island when the winter arrived. They were living there for four months. When they ran out of their food supplies, they were eating what they hunted. When they ran out of ammunition, they hunted with spears. Many people considered them already, understandably, to be dead. Now, all of that is what I call a fascinating story. But now, let's have a quick look at the journey of Robert Perry. He gathered 50 men, almost as many heavy sledges and 246 dogs. They faced several stretches of open water where the ice had split. Since they didn't have a boat, they had to wait until the ice closes up, which sometimes could take days. They were advancing at an average speed of 13 miles or 21 kilometers per day. Once the explorers were at about 134 miles or 215 kilometers from the pole, Perry also sent everyone back and set off further with only four Inuit men and Matthew Henson, a black American from Maryland, who accompanied Perry on many of his previous expeditions. After a few days, according to Henson's account, he had a feeling that they were at the pole. So he asked Perry to check his sextant. After having some sleep in an igloo, Perry took a navigational site with his sextant, but for some reason didn't tell the result to Henson. According to Matthew, then Perry took a note and a strip of the flag and put it in a tin which he buried in the ice. Then all of them returned home. So as we already know, both explorers claimed publicly to have reached the pole 
and the claims were made only a week apart. Now, Cook was willing to share the glory and accept his rival's claims, but Perry, on the other hand, was furious that Cook was trying to steal his victory. Now, we have to keep in mind that um, if both claims were to be accepted, actually, Cook would be the one that reached the pole first, so that's quite understandable. So even though both men were seasoned explorers, known from the earlier expeditions, Perry was the one to be taken much more seriously by the public and the press, mainly because Frederick Cook had just a very dubious reputation, given that some of his earlier claims turned out to be fraudulent. For example, he once claimed to have reached the peak of Mount Kinley, today Mount Denali, the highest peak and the highest mountain of the Northern America. And it turned out to be fraudulent. Also, Perry had just much more prominence and more powerful sponsors like the New York Times or National Geographic Society. Nevertheless, the explorers published detailed accounts of their journeys and stuck by the stories. They recognized each other claims to be a fraud. Both published later the versions of the truth in their books, which quickly became bestsellers, heating even more the public debate. And the thing is, this debate has never really ended. Generally, a bit more credibility was attributed to Perry. However, historians argue for decades who actually reached the pole. And, well, both explorers got close, no doubt about that. However, you can also clearly and easily see how they could have fugged readings and overstated positions as both of them were driven by the same thing, to be the first men to reach the North Pole. It was the last big quest for the explorers, really. On the other hand, they willingly altered the truth for their benefit in the past, so why wouldn't they do it this time? Modern analysis and expedition recreating Perry's route have put it in doubt that Perry could have achieved the distances per day he claimed. It's also worth mentioning that Robert M. Bryce, a historical researcher who spent 20 years studying the Great Polar Controversy, stated that analyzing all of the diaries, accounts and papers of the companions of the expeditions, it seems that apparently neither of the two men had reached the pole. Mr. Bryce explains that more in detail in his book Perry and Cook, The Polar Controversy Resolved. Interestingly enough, if and just if for some reason one would disregard all of the questionable claims, the first undisputed man to reach the North Pole was Roald Amundsen by airship in 1926. Which is interesting because, of course, he is known for reaching the South Pole. So imagine being a person that have reached both poles as the first man in history. That's, of course, not probably not true because some of the claims probably have some truth in it. But we'll never really know, and that's just a really interesting fun fact. Thank you for watching. Leave a like and a comment and consider subscribing to our channel. If you wouldn't mind visiting our Facebook group, that would be great. And check out these two episodes for more history.